Well, good morning and welcome to our live stream. I want to first of all just thank you so much for tuning in to our services here online and, and just thank you for being a part of our services in that way. But I would also like to just take a few moments this morning before we get started with our service to welcome you and invite you to come be a part of our in-person services here at Bellevue. We have so many different opportunities and ways that you can be involved with our church in person. Uh, on Sunday morning, that starts off with Sunday school at 930. We would love to get you plugged in one of our classes so that you can uh, grow together with other believers in the study of the word and also uh, just have a great time of fellowship there in Sunday school. And then again at 1045 here in the sanctuary at Bellevue Baptist, we have a uh, awesome worship service planned for you and we would love for you to come be a part of it. We have great worship. We hear the word proclaimed and uh, we're able to just take part in what it is that God is doing here at this church. And so again, we would love to have you be a part of those services. Again, Sunday school at 930, worship service at 1045. And we look forward to seeing you at the next available opportunity. But until then, we hope you enjoy this stream and that you receive a blessing from the Lord through it. Good morning, Bellevue family. It's so good to see you here this morning. If you'll please stand as we begin our worship.
better now? Okay. <laughs> Welcome to Bellevue Baptist Church. If you're visiting with us, we thank you for giving us the opportunity to get to know you a little better, and we look forward to serving you as a church. Uh, this is a, a special day for us. We will be observe, observing the Lord's Supper at the end of service today. Uh, also today for all deacons, uh, at 5.30 we will be having a special uh, prayer time at 5.30 this afternoon in the chapel, followed by our fifth Sunday night sing, hymn sing tonight. This is a first for us, and we're looking, I think a lot of people are looking forward to that, so uh, we'll see you then for that, and there will be refreshments after that in the fellowship hall. Also, there are sign-up lists for the Valentine date night dinner uh, in the foyer. There are also sign-up for offering envelopes, and your contribution statements for this past year are also available back there in the box as you go out the, the back doors there, so make sure and look for that. If you're needing tithing envelopes for this coming year, there's also a sign-up list under the TV for those. So make sure and uh, look at all those. The deadline for that will be this next Sunday. Uh, if you are involved with the greeter or security uh, teams on this, your forms for uh, the schedule for this next month are on the table out back and some in the foyer. We're not going to uh, start we're going to stop printing those. We've been doing those church-wide, but everybody doesn't have a need for those. So uh, if you're involved with one of those ministries, make sure and pick up one of those so you'll know when, uh, what Sunday is yours. Uh, also, next Sunday following morning worship, uh, the church is looking at trying to get a trip to the ark. Uh, we did that a few years ago, and it uh, didn't materialize, so we're going to try... Again, and next Sunday uh, following morning worship, uh, people that are interested in maybe taking that trip, it will be uh, March 31st through April the 2nd. So if you're interested in uh, going with us to the ark, uh, we're going to have a planning meeting or see how, who all is interested next Sunday following morning worship in the chapel. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in your house. We thank you, Lord, for this day that is packed with events. Lord, we ask that you would be with us throughout each and every one of them. Lord, we ask you to be with us in this morning worship service. If there's any here that don't know you as their Lord and Savior, Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit will move upon them at this time, and maybe today will be the day. Lord, we ask you to be with Brother Colt as he brings a message this morning. Lead, guide, and direct us in all that we do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you please stand again and join us?
full of so many things going on here at Bellevue, and, and we're so glad that you're here with us today. And again, uh, uh, this is just a special time when we're able to gather together uh, and to worship and to look into the Lord's Word. And so again, I'm glad that you're here with us today. Uh, this morning, we're going to be continuing our series through the Gospel of John. And so if you will, go ahead and be turning to John 1, verses 35 through 51. Again, John 1, verses 35 through 51, and today we are finishing up the first chapter of John, and, and uh, again, so excited about that, and 
looking forward to continuing this series with you here today. This morning as we get started, I wanted to share a story that I read with you, and the story pertains to a hog and a hen. And this hog and hen, they share a barnyard together, and they heard about a church's program to feed the hungry. The hog and the hen discussed how they could help, and the hen said, I've got it. We can provide bacon and eggs for the church to feed the hungry. The hog thought about the suggestion and said, there's a problem with your bacon and egg solution. For you, this only requires a contribution, but for me, it will mean total commitment. (laughs) Today, we're talking about discipleship, and and I want to share with you that that is the true cost of true discipleship. It is total commitment. And so we're going to see today that discipleship is a serious issue. It is something that does require all of us. In the church, we speak about discipleship frequently, but many of us are left wondering what exactly it means for our life and and what exactly is expected of us as Jesus' disciples. And so our sermon today, it might sound a little simple or it might sound elementary, but we are going to deal with Jesus calling his first disciples, and our sermon is titled, What Do Disciples Do? Again, seems like a a basic question, but I think it's something that we will find we need to reflect on and that we need to apply to our life. And so let's look at this text together and discover what do disciples do. John 1 verse 35, beginning there, it says, The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who had heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Father, once more we do come before you today, and Lord, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to pay the punishment for our sins that we might be disciples. Lord, we pray that today in this place as we look into your word that, Lord, you would reveal your will for us. That, Father, you would truly teach us what it means to be your disciples and that, Lord, you would equip us and encourage us, convict us and strengthen us to be better ones. Lord, we pray that everything we do here today in this place would bring honor and glory to you, whether it is the preaching of your word, Father, whether it is the singing of songs and hymns, Lord, and the partaking of the Lord's Supper. Whatever it may be today, Lord, we pray that we would do it in a way that would make you happy, Father, in a way that would bring you glory. So, Lord, now again, as we look into this word, we pray that you would bless it, and the Lord, you would bless us by revealing more of yourself to us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, in our text today, we really begin to jump into uh, some of the, the, the deeper parts of the story of the Gospel of John. We see that Jesus' ministry is about to start. Uh, he is calling his first disciples. And so the story really picks up where we left off last week. 
Uh, when we were together last week, we talked about John the Baptist's confession. You remember he is standing there and he's been talking about Jesus who is going to come and, and he, he has been giving these grand pronouncements about who Jesus would be. Jesus walks forward and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We saw that he prepared the way of the Lord by calling people to repent. He pointed them to Christ and he was very clear that Jesus was the Son of God. Of God. That's what we talked about last week. He made that grand pronouncement. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And you remember when we were there, that covered two days of, uh, of time. Remember John the Baptist is speaking in the first day, and then the second day is when Jesus comes forward and he says, Behold. And then now we are on the third day. Because it picks up here in John 1, and it says, The next day, again, in John 1.35. And so this is now the third day in which John the Baptist is involved in our storyline here. And what essentially goes on is that John the Baptist has baptized Jesus the day before, and now Jesus is walking by. John the Baptist is there standing with two of his disciples. And once more, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Now, it's interesting to me that the first mention we see here of disciples are disciples of John the Baptist. When we look at this here, we see that the disciples who are following John the Baptist, that's what they're doing. They're following him. They're helping with his ministry. They're learning and following teachers. In those days, it was not uncommon for people to uh, follow people who they esteemed to be great teachers or people of wisdom. And they would go and they would sit under them and learn from them by following them in every area and every part of their life. And so we see that John the Baptist has, has these disciples and they're with him. And the moment that he makes this proclamation, behold the Lamb of God, we see that these disciples go and they become Jesus' disciples. The main idea behind our sermon today is that Jesus is calling us to be disciples and he's calling us to make disciples. Probably not a new thought or a radical thought to you. But the question is, again, what does a disciple do? And I, I want to show you three things here from the text. The first one is the most obvious, and that is that disciples follow Jesus. Disciples follow Jesus. And we see this in verses 35 through 39. The two disciples heard John the Baptist make this proclamation. They have seen him uh, make these grand statements, and what did they do? It says they followed Jesus. The Greek word here for follow is uh, akolutheo, and it means to travel the same road. Literally, it means to travel the same road. They use this word to talk about people who went along with someone else. Not just to follow them, to see what he was doing, but to follow in his example as well. And again, this goes back to that concept of, of ancient discipleship, was where you would follow someone and learn from them in every area and aspect of life. So we recognize that we too are called to follow Jesus. Disciples are ones who follow him, seeking to learn from him in every area and aspect of our life. And I want to tell you that I, I believe true discipleship for each and every one of us will mean that there's not a single part of our life that's not touched in some way by following Jesus. Every aspect, every area, there shouldn't be one little nook or cranny in our life in which we are not changed by following Jesus and his example. We see that this is not just something that is shown in John, but in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus told his disciples what it really meant to follow him. In Matthew 16, 24, it says, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's what our little pig friend in the intro was talking about. Total commitment. See, if we're to follow Jesus, it means that we are giving up and denying ourself. And this is... Hard stuff. I'm not saying that this is easy because this means that we are not in control. He is. If you don't believe that's difficult, try riding in the passenger seat. I mean, I don't know if you guys are like this, but I, I do a lot of driving. And so when I'm in the passenger seat, it, it's hard for me to relinquish control. Not usually because I'm riding with bad drivers, but just because it's hard. I like to be in control, and, and maybe you're that same way where you like to, to be in control, and when it comes to our life, we most definitely want to believe that we are the captain of our own ship. We are in control of our own destiny, but when it comes to following Jesus, we're called to deny ourselves and follow. 
We are not in control. We can't just do whatever we want, but we do now what he tells us to do. Discipleship is not easy, but it is worth it. Throughout the scriptures, Jesus tells people to count the cost. One of my uh, favorite quotes from Martin Luther is this. He says, a religion that gives nothing, costs nothing, and suffers nothing is worth nothing. Friends, real discipleship will cost you everything. It will require you to, to suffer, but it gives everything and it is worth everything. So we recognize that it, it is a complete yielding before Christ. It is a complete following and denial of ourself. And I, one of my favorite ways to put it is, uh, is this in a way that only he could say it. John MacArthur says, Jesus isn't looking for a makeover, but a takeover. Being a follower, a disciple of Jesus, it doesn't mean that we just change how we look and we start talking like Christians and we start living a cleaner life. It includes those things. But on their own, they don't mean anything. God does not want us to be made up or cleaned up that we look like disciples but really aren't. Because a true disciple is one that is completely taken over by God. And we cannot follow God We cannot be a good disciple, a good follower, if we are constantly insisting that we are in control and that we are steering the boat. When I began to think about this sermon and and this concept, my mind immediately went back to a vacation that we took a few years ago. Uh, When we were in Alaska, we took a canoeing trip in Ketchikan. And uh, it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. It's this rainforest in Alaska. It's amazing and beautiful and we were canoeing. But we were with a group, and we were in these massive 12-man canoes. On the trip, some people were paddling and doing what we were supposed to do, and others, like this kid in front of us, were working against us. He was just going. He, he didn't know what he was doing, but he was paddling, and he was going, and he was splashing everybody else, but, but he was doing this. And we began to look around, and we noticed that about half the boat was doing one thing, and the other half of the boat was doing something else. If everyone's trying to be in charge, the canoe goes in a circle. And the same is true for our discipleship and our life. If we insist on being in control and going our own way and doing our own thing, we are going to live a life that goes in circles of sin and goes ultimately nowhere. At best, we are at the mercy of the current. One person has to be in control telling us when and how to paddle, how to move if we're going to get anywhere. And spiritually, that one person is Jesus Christ. He has to be the one to direct us, to to lead us, and we have to be following. These two disciples here, they are following Jesus. Jesus turns and sees them following him, and he asks them, he says, what are you seeking? And their response is, where are you staying? And then he says, come and see. Now this interaction seems a little strange, maybe. No one seems to be answering the question. And yet, there is a very big stuff going on here. The question that Jesus asked them, he says, what are you seeking? We would do well to ask ourselves that same question. Throughout the Gospels, we see that plenty of people follow Jesus for a time and and then leave. And the issue at hand is what they were seeking. People followed Jesus for food. Right? After he fed the thousands, people wanted that. They followed him for miracles. They followed him because they thought he was going to throw down Rome. But one by one, they all quit following. And, and what you see is those same people who were following him because they thought he was going to throw down Rome, those same ones who were waving palm trees and shouting Hosanna would be the same ones to shout crucify him. These people were seeking the wrong things. They would ultimately leave. At one point, so many of these false seekers have left that Jesus turns to his core 12 disciples and he asks them, are you going to leave too? And Peter's answer in that moment in John 6, 68 reveals so much. It says that Peter answered him, he says, Lord, to whom shall we go? 
you have the words of eternal life. The disciples here in our passage, they respond in a like manner. They say, where are you staying? He says, what are you seeking? And they say, well, where are you staying? Again, it seems like there's not really an answer, but there is. In effect, what these disciples are saying is, where are we staying? We want to go where you go. Where are you staying? And, and Jesus tells them, come and see. It wasn't about the destination. It wasn't that Jesus was staying in some really cool, great place that they wanted to go see. It wasn't that they were curious about where he was sleeping. It was that they wanted to be where Jesus was and where he wanted them. Friends, I, I want to say, if we're truly following Jesus, it's all about being where he is. So many times, I, I think we miss the, the beauty of heaven. The beauty of heaven is not the gold streets or the mansions or the stuff. It, it's being where Jesus is. It's being where he is. He, he, he ultimately told us that that was the point, too, when he says, I go to prepare a place, and where I am, you can come also, right? That's the whole point. Right, right now, you can't come, but ultimately, I'm going to prepare this place so that you can come and be with me. The beauty is in being where Jesus is. That is what discipleship is all about. As it's about following him and, and radically following him so much that we relinquish all control of our life. We, we are ultimately surrendered and yielded to whatever it is that he wills for our life. We go where he wants us to go. We do where he, what he wants us to do. And our focus is on being where he is and where he wants us. Jesus tells them, come and you will see. Guys, if we follow him, we are ultimately called to be where he is and again, do what he wants us to do. We see that the story continues, though, and we see more about what it means to be a disciple. Number two today, I want you to see that disciples invite others to follow Jesus. Number two, disciples invite others to follow Jesus. We see this here in, in verses 40 through 46. This passage is so amazing to me because I don't know if you recognize it on our read-through, but there are four testimonies right here in this passage. You can count them. John the Baptist is the first one where he says, Behold the Lamb of God. Number two is Andrew speaking to Peter. He says, we have found the Messiah, and then he brought, brought him to him. Number three, we see Philip. He says, we have found the one the law speaks of, Jesus of Nazareth. And number four is Nathaniel, where he testifies that Jesus is the Son of God. These are disciples, right? These are people who, and, and even though we wouldn't say that John the Baptist is a quote-unquote disciple, like capital D, he's one of the disciples. He was definitely a disciple follower of Jesus. And so if we're looking at an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus, then we have to recognize that this passage puts a whole lot of emphasis on inviting other people to follow him as well, to see other disciples. So we as disciples are boldly to go and invite others to follow him as well. If you read uh, any, anything about discipleship, there are tons of theories out there on what's the best way to do discipleship as a church and what are the best ministries. But one of my favorite uh, illustrations on this is the theory of duckling discipleship. Uh, and, and it comes from the idea of how ducklings are following their mama duck. I remember reading the kids' book, Make Way for Ducklings as a Child, and and uh, maybe you have, have seen ducklings at some point. But if you haven't, understand that they walk in a line. The mama duck is up front, and all the little baby ducks are following on along, and they're just as cute as they can be walking along. Each duckling is both a follower and a leader. In our discipleship, we need to recognize that we are both a follower and a leader. Like a duckling, we are following the one in charge. We are following Jesus, but we are also leading others to follow him as well. Now, you may be the ugly duckling, but you are a duckling. So we need to recognize that we are to lead others to follow 
Christ's example. One of the things that's so striking to me about this passage at, at first glance is, is the contrast between John the Baptist and, and, and some people we, would, we can imagine. Because John the Baptist was not mad that his followers left him and followed Jesus. John the Baptist says, uh, Behold, the Lamb of God. And what happened? His two disciples, they left and followed Jesus. Nowhere in there is John the Baptist throwing a fit. Nowhere in there is he huffing and puffing. He's not mad because this was the whole point. They were going to follow Jesus. It wasn't about them following him. It was about them following Jesus. And so if we're going to think about leading other people to follow Jesus, then we need to make sure that, number one, we're not trying to lead people just to have a following. But number two, we need to make sure that we're following Jesus first of all. We can't lead someone, again, if we're not following Jesus. I I love this quote from an old Puritan, uh, John Collins. It's one you've probably heard before. He says, you're to follow no man farther than he follows Christ. Follow no man farther than he follows Christ. Our goal as, as disciples, again, is to be following Christ, not people. We follow people, and as much as they point us to Christ, and they direct us to Christ, and they edify us in Christ. And so our job is to, number one, be following him, but number two, we're to lead others in Christ's example. Well, how do we do that? That seems to be the the $65 million question amongst all these discipleship people. How do we lead people to follow Christ? I'm going to share with you a few ways. I think one way we can do this is we lead well by following well. The closer we follow Jesus in our life, the more of him they're going to see in us. If you remember last week, the question was again, well, what do you have to say for yourself? When we follow Jesus, again, it calls us to live a particular sort of way. And the more that we're doing that, the more that we're going to be different from the world and the culture at large, and and the more that they're going to wonder what is up with us. And so when we follow well, then ultimately people will see more of Christ in us. But second of all, when we follow Christ well, we're going to be doing things that, that we can lead them more closely to him. Mark Dever says the how of discipling is not that complicated. It's about doing life together with other people as you all journey toward Christ. We make friends and then we walk them in a Christward direction. And that's a great way of describing it. We make friends, we walk them in a Christward direction. But here's the thing. We can't walk them in a Christward direction if we don't know what that is. So we need to be following him closely. Another way that we can lead people to follow Christ's example, another way that we can lead them to following him is is that we testify. Again, we we saw four testimonies, but three of them are personal evangelism stories. Look at them. We go back and we, we see John the Baptist again is, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's not just saying that just to say it. Obviously, the disciples were there, right? His disciples who, led and, who left him and followed Jesus. So he was saying this so the people would understand who Jesus was. But secondly, here we see Andrew to Peter. What happens in this situation? One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. What does it say? He first found his own brother and said to him, We have found the Messiah which means Christ, and then he brought him to Jesus. I'm sharing this with you because, again, there's a very specific thing here. We see that the first thing he did was go to his family who needed to know about Jesus, and he told him, we found him. He's here. And he led him to him. The third account we see is that of Philip. I mean, oh, sorry, of uh, Peter and Philip. Or sorry, sorry, I apologize. Philip and Nathaniel. 
Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Again, he goes to an individual, shares the gospel with him, that Jesus is the fulfillment, that he needs to believe in Jesus, and ultimately we see that that leads to an encounter with Jesus and him following Jesus as well. The emphasis again here is on inviting people to follow. And the, the example that we see here most prominently is that example of going to another person, a person whom we know, and sharing the gospel with them. Of course, we should be involved in evangelism in other ways, but personal, one-on-one evangelism with people who we have a relationship with, we know people. We know who they are. We know who's not following Jesus and who needs to be. And we are going to have so much better success if we go to them individually and we share the gospel with them. As the, the example of these disciples is to go to our friends and our family and to tell them who Jesus is. Then I'll share a, a final way that we can lead people and, and invite them to follow Christ is, is from the Great Commission itself. In, in Matthew 28, when Jesus tells them to do what? Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. Again, there's an emphasis there on teaching them to obey God's word. We, we share the word of God with them. And again, if we go back and we look at those evangelism encounters here, we see that there was even an emphasis of them in, in those one sentence things. For instance, the, the last one we looked at, he says, We found the one um, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. It's appealing back to Scripture. This is the fulfillment of all these prophecies that we have, and it's an explanation. This is the one who they've been talking about. It is Jesus. And so I want to encourage you, when we are inviting other people to follow Christ, we need to invite them to his word. So those are three simple ways. Again, we lead well by following well. We, we can invite them by testifying of who Jesus is personally. We can teach them to obey his word. So you see that. So, so far we recognize that disciples are people who follow Jesus. They're people who invite others to follow Jesus. It's the core. But number three, we also see the disciples see amazing things as they follow Jesus. Disciples see amazing things as they follow Jesus. Verses 47 through 51, we see this account. Remember, Philip goes to Nathaniel and, and he tells him, again, that great gospel invitation. We found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathanael says to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? He responds a little differently than the previous people we've seen so far in this text. He's hesitant. He hears the testimony and, and maybe responds with a little bit of prejudice. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip there, he, he doesn't jump into that. He just says, come and see. Come and see. And Jesus responds that there is no deceit in Nathaniel. Is that interesting? Nathaniel's first response is, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Jesus' response to Nathaniel is, he says, behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit toward him, and, oh, sorry, in whom there is no deceit. Nathaniel said toward him, how do you know me? This meant that Jesus was, was talking to Nathaniel here, and he's not saying that this is an Israelite who's perfect, but what he's saying is this is a good Jew. That phrase was used to describe good Jews, people who, who followed the law and, and did their best and who were trying to be active Jewish followers. And so when Jesus makes this pronouncement about Nathaniel, Nathaniel's kind of thrown off and he says, well, how do you know me? Essentially, he's saying, how do you know if I'm a good Jew or not? You don't know me from anybody. And Jesus says, before Philip called you, I saw you under the fig tree. Jesus is telling Nathaniel that he knew where he was, but better yet, he's telling Nathaniel that he knew what he was doing. 
Under the fig tree is a phrase used to mean that someone was meditating on God's word. The old rabbis would say, I'm going under the fig tree as a, a way to say, hey, I'm going to meditate on God's word. I'm going to go spend some time looking into the law and reading. So Jesus is telling him, I, I know what you were doing before Philip called you. You're meditating on God's word. And it's interesting because, again, Jesus is responding. He's saying, I know you were studying God's word. And Philip's whole point to Nathaniel had been about the fact that Jesus was the fulfillment of God's word that he had studied thus far. Jesus is essentially telling him, you have studied the word, you know what it says, here I am. And Nathaniel is convinced. Because he remembers what he has studied. He says, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus answers him, because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? Jesus says, you believe over that? Behold, you will see greater things than these. And he says to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the son of man. This is a reference maybe to the story of Jacob's ladder where Jacob sees this, again, this ladder of which the angels are ascending and descending in a vision. But we see here clearly that Jesus is the stairway to heaven. He is the only pathway from heaven to earth and from earth to heaven. The angels even ascend and descend upon him. And if we follow him, we are going to see amazing things happen. I can't tell you how many I have seen since I started following him. How many, and if you want to think about this, just think in your own life if you've been a follower for some time. Look back on how many prayer requests have been answered. Right? I I mean, I can't tell you how many times I have seen a a situation where I didn't know what was going to happen and the Lord worked it out. I look at how many requests he's answered, and I look at how many he has unanswered that were for very good reason. I look back now and I said, man, I did not know what I was praying about. We look and we see all the times where... I've seen God change so many people who I never thought he would. People who were so hard to the gospel and so hard to, toward him, and now they are following him passionately. How many miracles have we seen that that we kind of just gloss over? Those answered prayers, we we seem to forget about them and kind of file them away once they're over. But I want to remind you that as people who are following Jesus, we get a, a peek behind the curtain. We get to see what God is doing. We get to see him work in people's lives. We get to see ultimately sinners go from dead and lost to living and following him. We'll see him do amazing things. Guys, following him, it costs us a lot. It will require a lot. It will be difficult, but when we follow him, we will see amazing things that we cannot even comprehend or imagine right now. As in wrapping this part up, I I, I just want you to know that we need to be following Jesus as closely as possible. We need to be teaching others to do the same by obeying God's word. And, And we need to not take for granted the amazing things we see as his followers. This week, I would encourage you to really think and meditate. Get under the fig tree about what you can do to follow Christ more closely. There's always somewhere where we can be following him more closely. There's always some text that that we could better apply to our life. I I think of of Spurgeon who spoke about uh, how there were passages sometimes that he would wrestle with. And he says those ones that we wrestle with, those passages that are the hardest for us to accept, they need to become the ones that we love and study and meditate on the most. So we can follow him more closely. We need to seriously think about what we can do, who we can invite. 
who we can lead to do the same. If you're a disciple, right, if you're a believer, you are a follower. But if you're not, it starts by following him. Believing in him, trusting in him as your Lord and Savior. So if you're a lost person here today, if you wonder, what, who, who am I following? I'm spinning around in circles. My life is a continual circle of sin and going nowhere. You need to relinquish control and follow him. Throw yourself on his mercy. Trust in him. But if we have done that, then we need to follow him closely. Let's go to him in prayer. Father God, we come before you today, and Lord, again, we do thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be your followers, and Lord, we pray for those of us who are your followers that we would follow you as closely as possible that you would show us where we can follow you more closely, that you would show us and and call to our mind who we need to go and invite to follow you as well. And Father, we pray that today, if there is someone here who is not following you, that, Lord, you would call them to come and see. That, Lord, you would call them to come and follow you. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As we talk about following Jesus, uh, one of the things that we do as a church is follow his example. Specifically today, we are following his example in the ordinance of the Lord's Supper, uh, recognizing that it is something that is instituted by Christ and that reflects the gospel. Ordinances are, are things that we do in our church, again, that he explicitly told us to do, that reflect the gospel. Just as baptism uh, shows our being buried with him and being raised to walk in a new life, so do the Lord's Supper represent his dying on the cross for our sins. And so uh, we are going to, again, observe this today. And as this is something that reflects the gospel and something that has very real significance and consequences if it is done unworthily, we invite all those who are saved, uh, those who believe in and follow Jesus Christ to join us in the Lord's Supper today. And so if you, again, are a believer in Christ and have not received your uh, Lord's Supper elements, if you will, just kind of hold your hand up and we'll have someone come and bring that to you uh, in just a moment. But in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul speaks to the church in Corinth about taking the Lord's Supper in a manner uh, that was sinful. Uh, Paul warned them that they were doing it in a way that was not worshipful or serious or sacred. And so he speaks clearly on this in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 22. It says, But in the following instructions I do not commend you, because when you come together it's not for the better but for the worse. For in the first place when you come together as a church... I hear that there are divisions among you, and I believe it in part, for there must be factions among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry and another gets drunk. What do you, ha- what, sorry, what, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. Paul continues on in verse 27 through 34. He says, Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for judgment. About the other things, I will give directions when I come. The Corinthian church was more focused on eating than observing the Lord's Supper in a worshipful manner. In those days, they would eat big meals of bread and wine. And so... Uh, Paul warns us that any of us who do not do this today in a worthy manner are in a place of danger. He tells us to examine ourselves so that we do this from a place of true worship, a place of humility, and a place of reflecting on God's grace. He ultimately says that whoever does this without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on themselves. We today should discern the body, the body of Christ, 
This means that we should examine ourselves. We should confess our sins and our sinfulness to God. We should reflect on the fact that Christ's body was broken for us. And we should truly do this in remembrance of him. And so today, as such, I am going to give you a few moments to examine yourself, to reflect on Christ's grace. And so we're going to have a moment of silent prayer, and then I'll close that time with a, with a vocal prayer. So let's have a moment of silence to reflect. Father, we come before you today, and Lord, we come asking that you would help us to observe this, Lord, in a way that would be worthy. Father, we pray that we would do this again worthily in a way that would be pleasing to you, Father, with a full focus on your grace. Lord, today may we come to you in a place of unity, a place of humility, a place recognizing that it is all because of the sacrifice of Jesus that we are here. Lord, may we trust in that grace. And Father, may we do this from a place of worship today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you will, go ahead and open your uh, packet. There's the first one, so make sure that you pull the first tab and retrieve your uh, bread. First Corinthians eleven twenty three through 24, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Amen. This time, if you will, go ahead and open the grape juice. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty five, 25, it says, In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Again, as we do this, we recognize that these are nothing particularly special. It's grape juice, and it is a little wafer. But what they symbolize is the most special thing that there is. That Christ died for us. He took the punishment we deserve and we can be saved by his grace. The reason we do this is again found in verse 26. It says, as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Today by doing this, we are proclaiming that Jesus died for us and he will return for us as well. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we come before you again now, and Father, we pray that we would remember that your body and your blood being poured out are the only way that we are saved. Lord, let us not forget the great sacrifice which you made. But Lord, we praise you for that, and we proclaim your gospel. Father, help us to truly reflect that gospel to those around us. May we be found faithful to walk in it and to tell it to others. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the Gospels, it tells us that uh, at the first Lord's Supper, that Jesus and the disciples sang a song and they left quietly. And so following their example, we will do the same today. Our uh, worship leader is going to come and lead us in a song. And we ask that as we sing this song, uh, that you would then leave the sanctuary quietly today at the conclusion of the song. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, 